Hi, I'm the Malt Activist and welcome to Share a Dram, the show where I share a dram with the who's who of the whiskey industry. My guest today probably has the most enviable job title in the world, Global Brand Ambassador for Glenfiddich. Please allow me to welcome Mr. Struan Grant Ralph. Welcome to Dubai. Pleasure to be here. How's it going? It's going well. Yes. Is this your first time? First visit. I've been through the airport many times. Okay. But this is the first time spending some time in the market. And how are you liking it? It's incredible. It's, uh, it's defying expectations. We spent a couple of days here doing various events, launching a couple of new products. Um, Dubai is very impressive. Mm. Um, I came through Lebanon. I was in Beirut as okay. well. So yeah, it's been a great trip, really enjoyable. Where did you start and how the hell did you get this gig? Um, I started. I, I, I mean, I grew up in the shadow of some of the great distilleries of Speyside in a small town called Forest. Mm -hmm. So um, most famous, I suppose, for Ben Romick and Dallas Dew. Okay, yeah. My, my front and my back garden. The, um, the journey took me through a chemistry degree. So I studied uh, an applied chemistry degree at Glasgow University. Um, which took me into bartending, obviously, right. natural choice. Uh, and uh, very enjoyable decade and a half bartending in various places around the world. Um, and I also spent a couple of summers working at distilleries in Space Side. So okay. as a bartender from that part of the world, I always sort of championed, you know, that sense of like that spirit we were producing, the unique aspects of where I was from. Um, I, st I got my break, I guess, working with Inverhouse as was. So I was what, uh, at Anok. Uh, okay, so yeah. the Noctu distillery, yeah. I don't know if you've been. Um, not, not been, but... So a real hands-on distillery, worm tubs, you know, nice. like stenciling, casks, um, getting really like, I remember turning up on my, front, uh, my first day with a shirt and tie on and the whole crew just laughing at me <laughs> and uh, finishing up the summer just wearing, you know, jeans, t-shirt and I guess just solidified like the passion that I had. I built knowledge along the way. I mean. It's impossible to learn everything about this amazing spirit, sure. but I certainly, um, I just embraced everything I could. And then I took that on the road. I was based in Melbourne, Australia, okay. um, working on whiskey bars over there, some cocktail bars. Glenfiddich came knocking five years ago, and I was in the market for Southeast Asia, okay. uh, based out of Kuala Lumpur, and then latterly Singapore. We opened a Singapore office, and um, I suppose it coincided with the, the raise in popularity of Singapore, mm -hmm. so I was quite fortunate to, to ride that wave for a while. In the U.S. role, I was based in the U.S. for the last three years. Okay. And again, single malt's biggest market. Yeah. Um, by far and away, actually, they drink more better whiskey there than anything else. True. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, as the legend Ian Miller sort of hung up his cap, uh, I got the nod. So very, very fortunate, you know, as you said, enviable job. Yes. Definitely an honor to represent, uh, I mean, this great distillery wherever we go around the world. And, uh, yeah, you know, and to share whiskeys with, you know, enthusiasts like yourself. Wow, living the dream, huh? Living the dram, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, Ian Miller, like you said, absolute legend. I had the pleasure of meeting him a number of times, interviewed him as well. What word of advice did he give you? Yeah, I mean, Ian is a legend of the game. If I even come close to achieving half of what he did, I'll be very, very happy with my whiskey career. Uh, Ian was very honest. He just said, you know, enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. He said, get some sleep. He said, uh, learn to sleep anywhere you are, taxi, hotel, because you, obviously there's a lot of travel. Um, and he just said, you know, make the most of it because it's a great opportunity. And he, I mean, myself and our fellow 21 ambassadors now around the world have been mentored by Ian over the last decade. Mm. Um, so he's taught us a lot over the way, but he just, you know, a very natural guy, go out and enjoy yourself, you know, live everything that this opportunity can afford you. Um, we're very honest about the way we present our whiskies. Right, so right. Uh, he, he just said, you know, go out, enjoy it, and make the most of everything you can do. Now to the, probably the most exciting chapter uh, in Glenfiddich right now, uh, which is the experimental series, right? So what, what's, what's the thinking behind the experimental or the, or the maverick direction that Glenfiddich's taking? Yeah, I mean, a few different things at play here. We have uh, a history of innovation at the distillery. So um, you look up Glenfiddich in every single whiskey book of the last three mm. decades, the first chapter will say, this is the distillery that really brought the single malt category to the world. Absolutely. And 1962, 1963, a period of really strong innovation for the William Grant family, Gervin Distillery, vacuum distillation, the single malt category starting at Glenfiddich as a pure malt whiskey, and then through to things like Snow Phoenix in 2010, the Solera system in 1998, um, thermal vapor recompression for our distillation techniques. Um, always just driving, I guess, an innovative and pioneering spirit throughout uh, Glenfiddich's history. 
the modern era, now 2016, launching two new expressions. So one matured in local IPA casks mm -hmm. from uh, the Speyside Craft Brewery. Um, and won the product of all 20 ambassadors selecting casks. Really, um, just to make the most of, I guess, whiskey's new renaissance, to have stories with some interesting, um, you know, kind of, um, I guess, aspects to them, and to, you know, start bringing whiskey to a more modern audience right. um, that perhaps won't have got to know Glenfiddich over the last 40 or 50 years, that need to reacquaint themselves with this great distillery. So, mm. very exciting to have two new products in the market. Nice. So, I had this um, last time when I met uh, Ian, we had this chat about uh, age statement whiskies. And, and he's a, he's a, he's a uh, very strong supporter of age statement whiskies. Will age statement whiskies and the Maverick direction work together? Will they be able to? Yeah, it's a good question. The, um, the, the answer I liked was from Brian Kinsman, who actually makes all these whiskies right. and, um, you know, he, under the stewardship of David Stewart, really learned how to, um, I guess, influence his personality on the styles of whiskies he's going to make. Age statements for him are a guide for our core range, 12, 15, 18 and 21 year old Glenfiddich are, hmm. you know, world renowned, very popular whiskies. Um, but for him, experimentation can come when you're using a variety of casts of different ages and casts that perhaps we haven't been able to utilize in the past because we're, they're coming in at the eight or ten year age right. statement. So almost the shackles are off for Brian at this point. Ah, so yes. he starts to think, um, you know, you've probably tasted three or four year old whiskies that have so much power in the cask that they're, you know, behaving like we might associate a 20 year old cask. But are you then going to put that out in the market as a four year old? What, what would be the preconception from a market like Dubai where they're maybe guided a little bit more by age statement? Um, and so in Brian's case, the shackles are off. Um, you know, for, for me personally, we're very proud of having a core range of Glenfiddichs, which are age statements, and then an experimental range, which can actually give us the ability to play around with actually different styles, story-led, um, and uh, the ability to not be guided by one particular age statement. Next year's experimental project, which is kind of in the works at the moment, is old, I mean seriously old, okay. two decades plus potentially, but won't take an age statement because oh, okay. we may need to take casts from all over right. the place and are you going to be confined by a very low age statement probably you're not so it just gives Brian a lot more experimentation gives him the ability to try a few new things yeah and I suppose in the in the modern era for whiskey drinkers age is just a number but it's what's in the glass that really counts one of the burning questions of late with uh, compass box and the scotch whiskey association transparency campaign uh, can we expect something similar from Glenfiddich if we ask would you tell yeah, I think, I think it's a really, really interesting one. It's definitely an interesting time for the SWA and for Compass Box, which are a fantastic you know, yeah, organization, absolutely. really uh, pushing the boundaries of, I guess, of what Scotch can be for consumers. And also um, the, the hardcore of Compass Box consumers just really craving more inventiveness and, I guess, more creativity from casks. Um, on the Glenfiddich side, I think we've always been pretty transparent about the products that we've released. I mean, going back to things like Snow Phoenix 2010, mm. uh, we were pretty open about the cast that went in there. It didn't carry an age statement because sure. it was between 30 and 30 years old. Right. So do you negate old liquid by putting a younger age statement on? I love the new Compass Box three-year-old with 40-year-old liquid in it. I think it's just, it's almost subverting all those preconceptions. Yeah, yeah. It should be like that. I think, I mean, I'm probably ex an example of a, a younger generation of whiskey enthusiast who um, I don't drink by number, for example. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. drinking very, very nice bourbons that weren't defined by their right, age. Right, absolutely. You know, whiskeys coming from Taiwan with, you know, with Cavalan or yeah. Amrut, coming in at incredibly young ages, but with really, really well-developed characteristics because of the type of cast they were using, very active casts, and also the environment that they've been matured. So, um, I mean, Glenfiddich, if you ask, we'll tell. If okay. you meet any one of our ambassadors, we're all very honest folk. Um, we love the category. Um, we're not here to sort of circumvent, you know, like brand stories. Sure. I think if, if you sat down to taste, you know, Project 20, which we, you know, we'll have yes. a taste of this evening, I have the breakdown liquid actually with me. And these are oh, casts okay. between the 1990s and the early 2000s. And, and they're all there and each ambassador represents each different one. So yeah, transparency is key. We want to be quite honest about it, celebrate the category. And I don't think, I mean, Brand stories are great, but honesty in whiskey is really important as well. So you have no idea how much I appreciate 
hearing you say that. Now for the serious whiskey drinker, right? So there's this growing segment of whiskey aficionados, right? And who, who are done with off the shelf stuff and now want something a little more special, right? Uh, could be single casks, could be cost strength versions of your existing range, like the 15D, for example, which is an absolute cracker. And one of the many questions that, you know, I've gotten over uh, social media to ask you is, is there ever going to be 12, uh, a 12-year-old cost strength? Oh, yeah. I, I would yeah. personally love to see a 12-year-old cost yeah. strength. Even but if it is one off single yeah, cost bottling. Yeah, and I think there's a, f there's a few elements to this for a distillery the size of Benfiddich. And there's a practical complication for what we have to do in terms of um, not just spirit supply, but uh, maintaining the existing kind of following that we have for Glenfiddich 12, 15 and 18. Um, so it's, it's interesting because I, I really enjoy cast strength whiskies, non-chill filtered whiskies, whiskies in their natural state, and that's really what I came up kind of drinking. Um, and certainly as we move through experimental, there's definitely a, a view to getting things at higher strength. So Project 20, for example, non-chill filtered, and it's right. at 47, which a lot of those casts were very active. They got to about that point. Um, Glenfiddich 12 at cask, non-chill filtered. Yeah, but I think if we were going to do it, we would have to do it um, maybe with an added kind of bonus. So we do have at the moment some quite heavily peated Glenfiddich. So okay. for three, and this is for the enthusiasts right now, for three weeks of the year for the last 12 years, we've made very, very heavily phenolic Glenfiddich. Oh, really? It used to happen over Christmas and New Year. So lower temperatures, better conditions for making very good, clean phenolic whiskey. And also, it used to be the um, time when the distillery went into shutdown, clean mm. and we would make peated whiskey. We were actually doing it, I was home a week and a half ago. So the whole, imagine that area of Dufton that you're used to smelling so sweet and malty, smelling smoky and peaty. So those things are there. We have, I tell you this, 72 different types of casts maturing right now. Okay. 72 different types wow. of casts. So inventiveness can come from cask finishing as well. Right. Um, all of our vintage releases are cast strength non-chill filtered. So last year we released a 1978 vintage, there, yeah. which went to the US. Yeah. Um, I know that there was plans and some planning to bring one into this market as well, because there's definitely, I think, the appetite mm -hmm. to, to bring something of that ilk in. And when we're going into those older you know, ages, we do like to release them as cast strength non-chill filters. Right. So. Ian actually shared with us, a, I think it was a 1990 vintage 26 year old or an 89 vintage uh, last year, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, heavily sherried. Heavily sherried. Yes. I yeah. think it was maybe 24 years old. I think it was a 1990 vintage. Very nice. Yes. And th I guess that, that, that was the kind of stuff that other than the core range, we as whiskey aficionados, enthusiasts would really look forward to, you know, sinking yeah. our teeth into. Yeah. We have a program called the Glenfiddich Gallery as well. So you can actually go direct to our distillery and select casks, select bottle type. We have a whole, range of different styles mm. in that 1990, 1980. Okay. We have a lot in the 1970s, bourbon casks, sherry casks, refills, um, which you can actually, depending on your palate, and I feel like you're a bit of a sherry monster, mm -hmm. um, you could hand select, bottle yourself at cast strength and nice. share with your friends. That is an option that we do have. Um, but the, uh, you know, I mean, I've been asked a few times about cast strength, 12 year old. It would oh, really? have to be something that had an added extra to it. I, I agree, I understand what you're saying. Right, so uh, one uh, last quick question. Since we're here for the food pairing with At uh, Atul Kocher at uh, Rang Mahal, right? So two-star Michelin chef, he's paired uh, the food based on the whiskies. Now, I've, had, I've been to a lot of food pairings, food and whiskey pairings, uh, where the food is prepared spe specially for the whiskey. Is there ever a possibility of a whiskey being prepared for a specific type of food? Yeah, it's a, really, it's a cool question because I've, I've been sitting in quite a few creative meetings for different styles of whiskey and um, yeah, I guess, as you said, whiskies are created in Scotland and then we send them out into the markets and the markets maybe um, interpret them in different ways. So I love going to Japan and drinking whiskey with sashimi, that right. texture and saltiness and layers of flavor work incredibly well, particularly with the Japanese style, but also to an extent with the Glenfiddich style. Um, one of our sort of signature pairings, I guess, is always cigars as well. Yes, yeah. And certainly in the past, we have worked with cigar producers to create whiskies that are, are paired specifically with certain types of cigar. In terms of food types, yeah, it's so it's so difficult because 
culturally every different market has a different way of interpreting the way to drink whiskey. So, you know, my travels over the last few weeks, I was in Beirut at the start of the week, you know, whiskey, loads of cigars, but loads of kind of meze style and grilled mm, meats mm, and things like mm. that. Um, we, when we, we did create a whiskey for the US market, which was a 14 year old bourbon barrel reserve, and straight away we were like barbecue. Oh, you know, okay. I mean, you sit and eat barbecue food, southern style, uh, and this whiskey really kind of reflect. And that's, I suppose that's quite symbiotic between heavily charred bourbon casks and Glenfiddich from American oak. True. It really shines, true. and then that innate sweetness that comes from you know southern style barbecue in the U.S. I'm not sure which came first, but they were definitely inspired by each other. Um, it's something to really look into. I don't know of any. I mean, I don't know if you know of any brands that have taken inspiration no, from food. I don't know. Yeah. I suppose we take inspiration from a lot of different things, topography, the geology, the culture, the area that you're coming from. If you're gonna push boundaries, yeah, I mean, pairing up with a Michelin star chef like we are tonight, you know, why not? Let's see what comes out. If something like this happens, you heard it here first. Yeah, we're taking dibs on that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for this. Um, what I did was, before uh, meeting with you today, was uh, on my Facebook page, I let everybody know that I'm meeting you and if they had any questions. So I've picked two or three, uh, without going into like massive details, uh, you can just, you know, um, answer them. So really quickly, uh, Keith Chong from Singapore asks, how many casks do you have sitting in your warehouse? Well, as I mentioned, 72 different types, types. So 72 different varieties of casks. So I think he wants to know the exact number. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know the exact oh, number Oh, you don't know? Well. Would, it, would it be like... seven warehouses. Wow. Would good. it be in the hundreds of thousands? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, literally there's the scale of Ben Fitting. Yeah, one true. Of course, um, but there's 47 warehouses between Ben Fittick and Balvenie, and we also have a few other storage spaces up there in Dufton. So um, there's enough. I know the number of warehouses. Um, I presume Brian and a few other select well, people would know. would know the exact number. But. Drew Mallon asks, can Glenfiddich please produce enormous amounts of snow to fall on the distillery? Or maybe just replace a warehouse roof with a tin foil during the winter? Yeah, wow, what whiskey, right? <laughs> I know. And, uh, I suppose um, opportunities like that come along and uh, we're all very proud of the product. I, um, I'm always impressed by people that have managed to keep hold of theirs and not open them, but it's great. Collectible whiskey, but also the juice is great, really nicely yeah. balanced. I think. Um, one of Brian's kind of great successes amongst many whiskies that he's created over the last decade. Um, and certainly like if another incredibly cold winter does come along or equally a very hot summer, but I think the cold winter is probably more yeah, likely than probably. North of Scotland. Yeah, that, you know, from adversity, something very special came out. So yeah, absolutely. Great well, thank you so much for your time, Struan. Pleasure meeting you. I really look forward to the pairing and, uh, and the absolute, of course, the whiskies. Yeah. This is the Malt Activist. Till next time. <laughs>